having examined a variety of ways of understanding what the church is and exploring what the church does as a demonstration or visible expression of what the church is, we now turn to the topic of mediation. And alongside the topic of mediation, we will examine how the sacraments function within the church. First, what do we mean by mediation? The term mediation can be found in a number of contemporary contexts, including legal disputes, individual or group conflict resolution, and even intradenominational conflict among churches. For our purposes, this definition from the Oxford Dictionary is a good start. Intervention in a process or relationship, an intercession. So when we speak of mediation, we are speaking of the church, or more precisely, the clergy, sitting between God and God's people, in some way mediating God's grace to God's people. Now this may make you uneasy, and I can understand why. After all, Jesus' death tore the curtain to the Holy of Holies in two from top to bottom, a dramatic symbol of the access to God's presence now open to all those who trust in Jesus. Jensen and Wilhite are very aware of this uneasiness, but at the same time they want to hold in tension that the church does play a crucial role in embodying God's presence on earth. Here's what they say. First, God has freely chosen to bind God's self to the church. And so God's activity is discernible in and through the church. And secondly, though, God is not bound by the church physically, spiritually, or effectively. In other words, God can work mightily even in the midst of a sinful church. So to tackle the first part of this tension, that God has bound God's self to the church, and therefore the church does embody God's presence, we might ask, how? How does the church embody God's grace? Or how does the church embody God's effective presence, as Jensen and Wilhite define it? Well, this leads us to a conversation about means of grace, or channels of grace, or even sacraments. There's a tension here similar to the tension between visible and invisible that we discussed in the lecture on marks of the church. The church embodies God's grace when it participates in the sacraments found throughout Scripture. Baptism, communion or Lord's Supper, prayer, or, and reading Scripture. But the mysterious way in which God's invisible power and presence actually works is that it is not bound by these four sacraments or bound by anything else, for that matter. So we can say, we Christians are bound to the sacraments, while God is not. Let's look briefly at these four sacraments or means of grace, and we'll start with baptism. Baptism, of course, takes different forms depending on your tradition. Everything from babies in white dresses and a few drops of water to teenagers being dunked in the sea off the coast of England, that one I've done actually, to ornate baptistries reserved for the immersion of adults. All of these and more are examples of the practice of baptism. The purpose of our discussion here is not to delineate which is the right practice of baptism, but rather to explore what baptism means, the theology of baptism, and how it affects how we think about the church. First, we might think about baptism being an individual act. It is I, after all, who am baptized. And particularly in the case of those traditions that practice believer's baptism, the individual is the one who makes the decision to be baptized. However, we cannot limit the significance of baptism to an individual's act. This is precisely because baptism is by nature a passive, receptive act. That means that it requires someone to do the baptizing in order for someone else to be baptized. Therefore, secondly, baptism is a communal or corporate act. It is the church who baptizes, or more precisely, a representative of the church, almost always an ordained minister who baptizes. There is power in these two ideas working together. It is God who calls the individual, 
and the church who corporately confirms that call and welcomes the individual into the community of God through baptism. So what happens in baptism? Well, Colossians 2 indicates that there is a unification with Christ that is happening in baptism. When you were buried with Christ in baptism, Paul says to the church in Colossae, you were raised with him through faith in the power of God. There is also an inclusion in the body of Christ. This gets back to the idea of baptism as a communal act. Baptism marks, to use a word from our previous lectures, baptism marks one as a member of the church. It is also worth noting that, as the Anabaptist tradition reminds us, baptism, as a means of identifying us with Christ, is inherently a declaration of allegiance to Christ and a repudiation of allegiance to any other false god. Combining this idea with the incorporating idea of inclusion in the body of Christ leads us to conclude that baptism is also a political act. It is an act in which one is gathered into a new heavenly kingdom and gathered from an old worldly kingdom. The regenerative nature of baptism is hotly debated, and these debates often center the chronology of events, such as repentance, then belief, then water baptism, spirit baptism or spirit indwelling, and initiation into the community of the church. These happen in a specific order. But Jensen and Wilhite helpfully point us in the direction of trying to hold the significance of these different events and hold them together theologically, even if they cannot be held together in time. The second sacrament we will discuss is prayer, which ought to be the natural posture of the church. This metaphorical posture can be demonstrated physically in the act of going to one's knees and bowing one's head in order to pray. This does not mean that prayer can only be done in this physical posture. Of course not. But the physical posture demonstrates for us the humility and passivity inherent in prayer. Prayer is the natural posture of the church because the act of asking and receiving in the Matthew 7 Sermon on the Mount kind of way, is all we can do. It is God who answers and gives. We simply receive. In this sense, we might connect the sacrament of prayer to the sacrament of baptism, as they are both receptive actions. They are both received as gifts or grace from God. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 is another good example of this idea. Every clause of the prayer Jesus taught his disciples is a petition. Let your name be hallowed. Let your will be done. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us. These petitions all betray our basic human need and dependence. Because we are human, because we are creatures, we ought to be prayers, people who pray. But thinking about prayer also helps us to think about the idea of mediation more fully. For it is surely Jesus who mediates or intercedes on our behalf as he sits at the right hand of God the Father. We read this in Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 25. But also Romans 8 speaks of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us as one who groans in intercession even when we do not know how to pray. And so by individual and corporate prayer, we are placing ourselves in the posture of those who are in Christ, but who also yet long to be found in Christ. We are still in need, and therefore we pray. The third sacrament is scripture, or rather studying the scriptures. But such study can be done rightly or wrongly. Or rather, I like using the words faithfully and unfaithfully. First, the very act that we search the scriptures, as John Wesley put it, suggests an element of faith that we might find something there. 
Second, the word faithfully implies faithfulness and therefore begs the question, faithfulness to what? Third, using the terminology of faithfully and unfaithfully searching the scriptures helps us to frame our approach to scripture as one that is ongoing and in flux. We must constantly be returning to the scriptures in order to search in hopes of finding and in patience when we struggle to find. Jensen and Wilhite answer the question of what is being searched for with the obvious answer, even the Sunday school answer, Jesus, the Messiah. All of the scriptures point to this one who forms the center of our faith and our very being as the church. But they are also quick to balance this Christological hermeneutic with the caution that, quote, moving too quickly to the Christological reference of Old Testament texts without wrestling with the literary sense of those Old Testament texts can find us missing nuances which enrich our knowledge of and communion with Christ. With this caveat and balance, we might affirm their interpretive framework, namely that all of the scriptures point to Christ. But then we still need a Trinitarian foundation on which to build this framework. God the Father speaks in Scripture. It is God the Son, himself the Word of God, who is spoken in Scripture. It is in and through God the Spirit that the Word is spoken and heard. So we might think of this interpretive framework as Christological insofar as it is robustly Trinitarian and theological. Scripture in and of itself holds no authority apart from this theological grounding. It is God who is sought in the Scriptures, and God who has chosen to be revealed through the Scriptures and through Jesus. So what then of those times... When we come to the scriptures and find ourselves lost, unable to see Jesus, unable to find God, unable to understand? Or what of those times when the scriptures seem to point somewhere we don't want them to point? How are the scriptures a means of grace, a sacrament in those times? Here we are most profoundly helped by looking and listening to communities that have been marginalized and oppressed, communities that have had the scriptures used against them, used to rationalize their decimation and abuse. The African American church in the U.S. embodies an answer to our question. Esau Macaulay, New Testament scholar, writes that, among other distinctives, a black church hermeneutic is marked by patience that allows for wrestling with the text, that requires waiting for a blessing from the text, and that is marked by trust that the God of the scriptures will bless when he is sought. The fourth sacrament we will consider is the Lord's Supper, what is also known as communion or the Eucharist. All three of these names for this sacrament are helpful in their own ways. The Lord's Supper, or Last Supper, reminds us that this was a practice instigated by Jesus himself in the final hours of his earthly life with his disciples. And it also reminds us that as a supper, it was a meal that, that itself had a reminding effect. The Passover points back to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. In this way, the Lord's Supper is an echo of the Passover, connecting the themes of rescue and liberation of God's people in the exodus and in Jesus' death. Calling this sacrament communion reminds us that it is a corporate and communal act in which we are, together as the church, sustained by Jesus' body and blood. In our participation in this sacrament, we embody our invisible and mysterious participation in Christ's body. And we do it as a gathering community across time and space because the risen Jesus is not bound by time and space. <laughs>
Finally, the name Eucharist helpfully illustrates the appropriate posture for the church in administering and participating in this sacrament. The word Eucharist comes from a Greek word which means to give thanks. So it is with a posture of gratitude that we partake of Jesus' body and blood. Jensen and Wilhite also remind us that there are three temporal angles at work in the sacrament of communion. There is a past angle in the remembrance of Jesus' death. We recall Jesus' sacrifice, its costliness, its visceral imagery, its affective nature, and we are drawn together around his cross as he is lifted up. This remembrance again ties the Lord's Supper to the Passover meal, which itself remembers the Exodus. Such remembrance puts us in the place of the slave, the oppressed people of Israel, as they long for God's deliverance. Now there is also a present angle in the proclamation of Jesus' resurrection. While simultaneously remembering Jesus' death, we are conscious that he is now risen. In tandem with our proclamation of Jesus' resurrection is the affirmation that Christ is present with us in the sacrament of communion. And much debate has ensued as to the nature of Christ's presence, whether physical or figural or something else, but that Christ, but that Christ is present is not debated. And this is simply but profoundly based on an affirmation of Jesus' physical resurrection. There is finally a future angle to this sacrament in our waiting for Christ's return in glory. In 1 Corinthians 11.26, Paul says in the supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So the act of communion is also an act of hope a foretaste of the kingdom, not unlike the deposit of the Holy Spirit in our lives who testifies to our life in Christ and groans inwardly for our Abba, Father, even now. We started this discussion with a definition of mediation, and we went on to discuss the means of grace or sacraments, which are administered or mediated by the church and the ministers of the church. That such mediation occurs and is imbued with rich theological history and present significance is not to propose its primacy. In other words, Jesus is the one true mediator between God and humans and between humans and each other. Christ's role as mediator cannot be replaced by the church's role in mediation. But neither can we ignore that Christ is embodied by his people and that the Spirit enlivens that people such that there is an affective practice of mediation that takes place in the church. So we now turn to discussing missiology as a way of connecting the inward focus of mediation with the outward focus of the mission of the church. Missiology is a theological field of exploration and expertise all on its own. Its theories, practices, history, etc. could all be explored more deeply than we will have the space and time to do here. And we will also be returning to themes of mission in some of the other lectures for this course. But it is important to include a discussion of mission as a rounding out of our discussion of ecclesiology because mission is inextricably connected to who the church is, what the church does, and even what the church believes. A perfect example of this connection comes from Acts 15, where we read about the first major dispute among the first followers of Jesus. As Paul had begun traveling the Mediterranean world, preaching the gospel and planting churches among the Gentiles, some Jews had begun to theorize that if Gentiles wanted to follow Jesus, they would have to be circumcised, follow Jewish food laws, 
and keep the Sabbath, essentially become Jewish. So we can see that it is Paul's missionary work that prompts this first major question in the early church. And the substance of the question is not just about Gentiles following Jewish laws. The substance of the question is about who the church is, what the church does, and what the church believes. Is the church a family of all peoples gathered around and united in the person of Jesus Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit? Does the church actively cross ethnic and social barriers such as Jew-Gentile distinctions? Can Paul and Barnabas and anyone else continue to preach the gospel to Gentiles? Are these new churches made up of predominantly Gentiles actually churches at all? What does the church believe about who can be part of the church? What does justification mean? Are the manifestations of the Holy Spirit the same across all people who receive the Spirit? These are all questions at hand in Acts 15, when the Jerusalem Council meets. All of these spring from the work of mission, or call into question that work. So it is a profound point that Jensen and Wilhite make when they say that all of the early church's ecclesiology and theology is being worked out in transit, in the midst of missional movement. But wait, when we think about mission, I think we naturally think about work that the church does. And so we might think about missionaries or mission trips or mission funds. None of this is wrong thinking, of course, but we want to be careful to see all missional work in the church as our fallible and often flawed attempts to participate in God's mission, or missio dei in Latin. The understanding of Missio Dei helps us to see that as the church, we have been graciously included in a divine initiative that has already begun and is ongoing. This idea in itself is grounded in the foundation of Trinitarian theology. In Trinitarian theology, we have the idea that God the Son is eternally sent forth from God the Father. And this sending is framed in terms of mission. The Son was sent to seek and to save those who are lost. God is a missional God. This means that mission is first God's project, not ours. But the reality of the church's mission has been far from consistently aligned with God's mission. This can be seen most obviously from Constantine forward in church history, and we will explore some of these historical events in the coming weeks. But we might recall to mind the Christian Crusades, where vast numbers of Muslims were slaughtered. Religious wars fought throughout Europe during and after the Protestant Reformation. Colonial expansion in the Age of Enlightenment, which necessitated the transatlantic slave trade and the decimation of native populations around the world. All of these were done within a framework of Christian mission. So while we affirm that the church's mission finds its origin and home in God's ongoing mission, we also lament and repent for the countless ways in which the church has distorted and perverted God's mission. Now, in order to talk about mission, we must first examine the relationship between kingdom, church, and world, all of which bear on our understanding of mission. In the first place, kingdom, church, and world are all different and distinct, but profoundly related and intertwined. The church is not the kingdom of God, but it is a foretaste or sign of the kingdom. The kingdom is neither the church nor the world, but it will encompass, restore, and reconcile both church and world when it is realized in all its fullness. The world cannot be thought of as in opposition to the church, 
particularly in an us versus them kind of way, the church exists for the world because Jesus, who reigns in the kingdom of God, was sent to redeem the world. In the Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry paper written for the World Council of Churches, we find a neat summary of the relationship between these terms. The church is called to proclaim and prefigure the kingdom of God. It accomplishes this by announcing the gospel to the world and by its very existence as the body of Christ. It is within this framework that we might begin to talk about what the church's mission might look like and who specifically it is for. What the church's mission should look like is reconciliation. Identical to our understanding of mission overall as being God's from start to finish, so is reconciliation. The church's mission ought to be shaped by a message of reconciliation. But that message is a proclamation and affirmation that reconciliation has already been accomplished in and through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. So reconciliation is not something the church accomplishes so much as it is something the church is a witness to. This is precisely the sense of prefiguring the kingdom of God. For this reason, reconciliation is not only evident in humanity's relationship to God, though it certainly is evident in that, it should also be evident in humans' understanding of themselves, humans' relationship to one another, and in humans' relationship to the rest of creation. Reconciliation, then, the kind of all-encompassing, revelatory, once-for-all reconciliation, is a full reversal of all the effects of sin. This is what drives the church's mission. As to who the church's mission is for, well, we've already provided an answer of sorts to this question. The church exists for the world, and therefore the church's mission encompasses the whole world. And this idea is grounded not only in Jesus' all nations language in Matthew 28 and ends of the earth language in Acts 1, but it is also found in the scope of the original promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, that he was chosen to be a blessing to the nations. But more specifically, we affirm that the church's mission encompasses all denominations, Israel, and other religions. The practical approaches of the church's mission toward these different groups are more appropriately reserved for a missiology course. We can suffice it to say that the practical approach toward the ecumenical project is different from the practical approach to ethnic Jews, is different from the practical approach to people of other religions or no religion at all. These will all be different practical approaches. But the fact that the triune God is gathering a people from all peoples is not in dispute and should motivate the church to be open, welcoming, and hospitable, to be a tent big enough to include all those the Spirit has led to the Father in the Son. This is the church's end goal.